I, I forgot to tell that there is a there is also a second prize for a, a nano iPad uh, for those that will come now and sing a song. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Don't have money for that. Uh, uh, you'll hear a very annoying buzz after two and a after uh, two and a half minutes, not two and a half hours. Yeah. Uh, uh, that will tell you that your time is off. Please finish before that. If you are not moved when the buzz is done, the next guy in line will just push you away because you are taking his time, okay? So please be polite, and uh, when you hear the buzz, that is it. And if you finish beforehand, you get an extra point, okay? So that's the, that's the idea. So those that you that prepared 15 slides, they are not going to make it, okay? So stop after the third one. Uh, Here's the, we have a new video master. Okay, hi, uh, everybody. I am uh, Oren Shaya. I am a postdoc at the uh, David Sachs uh, group. So I'll begin. Uh, on the first panel, you see a fly, a fruit fly. Okay, so uh, biologists really love flies. They really can't get enough of their flies. And as you can see on the back of the fly, there is a tissue. In the tissue, some of the cells are regular cells, and some of the cells have hair cells, okay? But uh, when, we start to, when the tissue is starting to develop, all the cells are the same. So we get two things. One, that some of the cells decide to be a hair cell, and also we get a really nice pattern of cells. You see the hair cells are not touching one another and they're really uh, evenly distributed. So in order to get a really nice pattern like this and in order for the cells to decide which one are the hair cells, they need to talk to one another, okay? So how do cells talk to one another? So this is panel number two. We, we are studying uh, the not signaling pathway. That is one way that cells can talk to another. The delta cell is the ligand, and the not, shell, not cell is the receptor. When the delta and the notch meet, the notch is cut, and then we get some sing signal in the cell, and this is how the cells talk to one another and coordinate, okay? So we want to study this system, but this system has a lot of talking in it. We, we find it hard to control the system. So what we do is we take only two cells, we put them only in two squares. One is expressing only the receptor, one is expressing only the ligand. And now we can really nicely control the system. So one of the things we study is the length of the, uh, of the connecting area. Okay, so we ask ourselves how, okay. how, we ask ourselves how is the talking affected by the area of the touch, okay? And as you can see, we use micro, uh, micro patterning to really nicely put cells, one of each kind, into the cavities, and then we can really uh, control their talk. Okay? So if you want to hear more about this, please come to my poster. Bye. Hi, my name is Adar. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, working with Yael Reichman and Chaim Diamant, and we are interested in the dynamic of colloids uh, near a single wall. Today I'm going to tell you about a surprising effect we found in our lab. If we take uh, the simplest case of two micron-sized colloids uh, suspended in an infinite aqueous medium, we know that the long-range hydrodynamic interactions decay like 1 over R r being the interparticle distance. If we now increase the density and add more particles, these particles will disturb the uh, long-range correlated motion, and it turns out <laughs> never mind, that the um, uh, long-range correlated motion weakens uh, due to density, and in terms of um, um, viscosity, uh, effective viscosity, the effective viscosity uh, increases uh, in respect to the fluid viscosity as we increase the density. Now look at, uh, we look at another case 
of two micron size uh, uh, collides now confined between two parallel walls. We know that the hydrodynamic interaction, the long range, decays like one over R squared. R, in, again, being the interparticle distance. If we now increase the density, uh, we know uh, it turns out that the uh, density does not affect the long range correlated motion. Uh, hence, they are um, density independent. And, and in terms of the effective viscosity, the effective viscosity is the fluid viscosity. Our experimental system consists of uh, silica colloids uh, with diameter of 1.5 microns suspended in an aqueous medium. Due to density uh, differences between the uh, silica and water, the colloid sediment to create an almost two-dimensional suspension <laughs> floating above the chamber's floor. The in-plane motion of the two-dimensional suspension was already characterized both theoretically and experimentally in literature, and we know that the um, uh, long-range correlated motion decay like one over R cubed. So our research question was how does density affect the long-range correlated mo motion in this case? Meaning if we increase uh, and add more particles to the, to the two-dimensional suspension, what will happen? And we found out both theoretically and experimentally that the density enhance the long-range correlated motion opposite to the case of unconfined uh, suspension. And we, if we look at the, um, in the point, uh, to the point of uh, effective viscosity, the effective viscosity, effective viscosity decreases in, uh, relative to the fluid viscosity uh, as we increase the density, a really surprising and not intuitive effect. So <laughs> come to my poster and I will tell you all about the theoretical and experimental uh, details of this surprising effect. I don't know what how does it work. <laughs> this one? Okay. Good evening. My name is uh, Alon Trever from the group of Odell Hood. Uh, our work deals with uh, silicon nanotube, their electronic pro properties and stability properties. Usually when people think about nanotube, they think about carbon nanotube that can be imagined like a rolled graphene sheet, as you can see over here. Silicon atoms prefer sp3 hybridization, so they would look like more this one. The wall will have a thickness of a few atoms and there will be a passivating atom, in this case, hydrogen. We have used a DFT calculation to calculate uh, four couples of silicon nanotube and silicon nanowi nanowires, uh, each one in a different uh, growth orienta orientation of the silicon uh, lattice. Oops. The results show that for each couple of silicon nanowire and silicon nanotube, the silicon nanotube will have a bigger bang gap. This is a diff this, this is a three different um, functional of the DFT, and the silicon nanotube will be a little bit less stable. When we have plot the bang gap vs the uh, molar fraction, edge molar fraction of each one of the silicon nanowire and nanowire and nanotube, we have received received a linear, um, linear fit. These uh, results can um, demonstrate the ability to control a uh, silicon uh, nanostructure by controlling their um, dimension and chemical uh, composition. Silicon nanotubes give us the ability, another degree of freedom, the, con the controlling of um, the, inner, the inner diameter. Um, controlling the bang gap is very important to various of applications, such as uh, electronic devices, solar panels, and more. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Dana Kreppel. I'm a PhD student of the uh, Obed Hod. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at is uh, graphene's capabilities as a potential chemical detector. So for those of you who know graphene, um, pristine graphene is uh, chemically um, inert. 
and uh, the operational principle is um, based on the changes in the electrical conductivity uh, due to the absorption of uh, all types of uh, gas molecules which serve as uh, either donors or acceptors. And it was recently shown that uh, the adsorption process or the desorption um, is behave uh, like in a step-like manner. Um, and this suggests that graphene has the capability of detecting single molecules. So what are we doing in the lab? Um, we're performing DFT calculations uh, based on a pretty simple idea. We take the pristine nanoribbons, which means that we know their electronic uh, properties and, uh, and their band gap, for example, and uh, we introduce lithium atoms. Uh, these lithium atoms uh, form cat cation uh, pi systems due to the trans uh, charge transfer. And you can actually see that this is accompanied with a very significant decrease in the band gap. Sometimes they're even metallic. And on top of that, here you can see a benzene molecule, but you can take whatever you want. You can say if you're going to the airport, you can use TNT molecules or different drug types or simple gas molecules. And for each of them, you can see measurable um, changes in the electronic properties. So this also suggests graphene is a very selective and sensitive detector. So for more information, come see my poster. Thanks. Hello, my name is uh, David Schreiber. I uh, work with, um, I, I'm a PhD student in, uh, in uh, Slava Prelov group, and um, I present work on our electrodeposited uh, cobalt nickel phosphor uh, micromagnets and their integration into MEMS devices. So what we first started doing is uh, evaluating our magnetic thin films. These films are about one micron uh, thick. Um, and what we can see is that when we deposit the, <clears throat> the films at different, at, uh, different current densities, uh, we, um, we can uh, see a different uh, crystallographic anis uh, anisotropy. At lower current density, we have uh, a peak at 002. These are XRD uh, plots. And the peak at 002, uh, 002 for Coney P films um, represents an out-of-plane uh, crystallographic anisotropy. When we increase our uh, um, current density to 120 milliamps per centimeter squared, we actually see a decrease in the peak at 002, and we uh, see a peak uh, all of a sudden at 100, which corresponds to an in-plane um, crystallographic uh, orientation. So, what does this mean? Um, when we uh, do our squid measurements and we measure our magnetic fields, we see that at lower current density, 30 mil, uh, 30 milliamps per centimeter squared, we actually have uh, a better, a better out of plane magnetic material. Whereas when we uh, see our films at one, uh, when we deposit our films at 120 milliamps per centimeter squared, we uh, see a film which is um, has better in plane uh, magnetic properties. So, um, what we do with these films is we integrate them into our MEMS devices, which this is a tilting plate. The tilting plate um, incorporates both an electrostatic comb drive as well as these coils, and the, the co and the plate can be actuated by the comb drives or by the coils. The, what you don't see is that on the plate we have our magnetic thin film. So when we actuate them by the, the, uh, by the coils, we see a significant, uh, significant difference in our actuation. Um, when we actuate the devices without magnetic material, uh, we see a very small um, we see very small actuation of about, I don't know, uh, about three microns. When we actuate them with our magnetic material, we see a very large actuation with about 30 microns. And these are uh, the similar devices. However, um, the, the difference is uh, very small in terms of actuating voltage. If you want to know uh, more about the comparison between other types of driving, electrostatic driving or uh, electromagnetic driving, you can obviously see it in the poster. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Edith, and uh, I'm a student of Shachar Richter's in the group uh, of bio, uh, bio and molecular electronics. And what we want to do is uh, take uh, BSA, bovine seroamalgamine, and use its uh, pro natural properties to bind uh, smaller molecules, such as uh, tetraphenyl uh, to bind smaller molecules, to make what we call a doped uh, bovine seroamalgamine with... Uh, uh, tetraphenyl porphyrin, porphyrin, okay, we see it here, or uh, tetraphenyl porphyrin with uh, metals, and actually, uh, ultimately, see if we actually can 
change the electrical properties of the bovine serum albumin by this uh, doping. But before we get to the electrical measurements, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. And the first is, can we, how can we actually prepare uh, those, this doped uh, bovine serum albumin? Whoever will come to see my poster will uh, know more about this. So how do we know that we succeeded? So both bo bovine serum albumin and tetraphenylporphyrin uh, adsorb light uh, in the UVV's uh, region, and what we see here is absorbance versus wavelength in solution of uh, aromatic residues in BSA and the highly conjugated uh, tetraphenylporphyrin. So we can uh, distinguish between these two uh, entities in our solution and actually uh, know that we prepared our dope bovine serum albumin. But we do not want to work in solution. We go towards uh, making electronic devices. So we want to prepare the substrate to the absorbance. And the property that we make the electrodes from <laughs> is uh, gold due to its uh, uh, appropriate work function. So what we see here is uh, the treatment of the uh, gold substrate before the adsorbance of uh, bovine serum albumin, okay? Annealing, enlargement of the grain boundaries and flattening the surface before the assembly of the protein. And the actual uh, assembly of the protein on the surface because what we want to get is a homogeneous monolayer of the bovine serum albumin uh, or the dope bovine serum albumin. So what we see here is atomic force microscopy uh, measurements of uh, patterns that we uh, correlate to proteins and the profile line of these patterns. Okay, seeing here what we know to be the thickness of a molecule of bovine serum albumin from the literature about three to four nanometers in height. But we don't uh, satisfy with the atomic force uh, microscope measurements. We go and do chemical analysis uh, using uh, PMI RAS, and again, we will come to my poster, we will talk more about this. What we, what we can see here is, uh, let me see also, <laughs> okay, so, fine, only conclusions. So we formed the doped uh, bovine serum albumin and we self-assembled it on the uh, surface and preparing the homogeneous monolayer with what we know to be the uh, theoretical uh, thickness of uh, bovine serum albumin, 4.7 nanometers, and the next step will be uh, to electrically measure the uh, layer. And I'm sorry, but I can't see my Now I need to figure this out too. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Gil from uh, the group of Professor Adi Arie, and my poster is about the airy beam laser. So let's quickly recall the properties of light beams that we all know. We all know from everyday experience and uh, some of our studies that light propagates in straight lines, it diffracts like any other wave, and if you put an obstacle in the way of a light beam, it will, uh, it will distort the light beam. Well, none of this is true for airy beams, and that's why they are such interesting beams. Airy beams that look like this actually follow a curved trajectory as they propagate. They have very low diffraction and they can self-heal. So if we take an airy beam and we put an obstacle that blocks a part of the beam, after a short propagation distance, the beam will restore its original shape. Magic beams. So you see they're all very interesting. Now let's quickly review what we know about uh, how lasers work. A laser is actually a light amplifier placed between two highly reflective mirrors. But one of the mirrors has a very slight transmission. So we have most of the light getting reflected back and forth between the two mirrors, and that keeps the laser working. And a small part of the light leaks outside, and that's what we see. And uh, because everything is so nice and symmetric, we get the nice round uh, beam shape that we all know and love. What we did in the airy beam laser is replace one of the mirrors with a, a reflective diffraction grating. This is just a set of silver teeth that's placed on a silver base, and I won't just tell you what it does, I'll show you, because I brought it here. This is a diffraction grating, you can see it, it's very small, but it's here in this holder. This is a green laser pointer, just a standard pointer, and I'll switch the pointer on, and of course now you can, it's, it's not very visible, but you can see it, right? So you see that most of the light it gets reflected just like from an ordinary mirror. Most of the light is in the, in the bright uh, round spot that's in the center, but a small fraction of the light gets reflected in another direction, and it's modulated into the shape of an airy beam. And that's exactly what we want. That's exactly what we want for the laser. 
So we have most of the light getting reflected just like from the ordinary mirror, and that keeps the laser working. And a small part gets reflected in another direction, goes outside of the laser, and modulated into the shape of an airy beam. So this is an airy beam laser, and actually this is a picture that we took of the beam that came out of our laser. And uh, if you want to hear more about this and see me do more amazing laser shows and hear how the same method can be used to make any, any, a laser with any beam shape, even holograms that change in time, then please come see me at Poster Number 8. Thank you. Okay, I hope it's mine now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is this a laser? Okay. Uh, so my topic is on friction and the nanoscale. Okay. <laughs> um, if we want uh, nano machines like the ones we see here, then we need the uh, super low friction so they won't turn out like this one here. Uh, this is experiments done by a group in Holland, and they showed that when we twist a graphene flake and a graphene sheet, we have a super labritic state. This is a state with almost no friction that we can measure. Itai. Itai. Itai 11. Yes. From a Oded Ot group. So, what we did, we developed a model which. Uh, cut, which measures the uh, interior corrugation in uh, layered materials, what we did is we, uh, this is for, okay, this is for a, a hey, boronite, we wanted to measure the uh, same corrugation, but instead of graphene and graphene, ex hexagonal boronitride and a graphene sheet. So we, de we developed a simple model, we call it the registry index. What we do is we just uh, ascribe circles around atoms, we measure the, uh, we measure the overlap between these circles. And what we see here, this is a register index. This is the DFT calculations. And we see that we get almost uh, exact results. Now, because uh, boron nitrate has a latest mismatch, 1.8% longer than that of graphene, then we get a really big unit cell, as you he see here, which is too big for DFT to calculate. And what we measured is that this system has a, is in a super labritic state without, and, instead, and what's different from graphene is that um, in, we thought in all, uh, in all the angles we twisted in it, this system will be in a super labritic state. And that's it. So come see my poster. <laughs> Hi, my name is Leonid Krasovitsky, and I'm from uh, Gil Rosenman's group. Uh, the theme is Peptide Nanodots Modification of Supercapacitor Electrodes. <laughs> this work was in collaboration with the uh, Elbit uh, uh, systems. Okay, a few basics uh, about uh, supercapacitors. Uh, supercapacitors, first of all, are capacitors. Uh, that means that if you have uh, two plates and you apply voltage uh, on them, and they're placed in electrolyte, uh, then uh, the uh, opposite ions in the electrolyte will come to the surface of the plate, and therefore they will uh, they will form a, a thin uh, layer and then around one nanometer thickness. And uh, because the capacitance is inversely proportional to the uh, thickness of this layer, uh, this capacitance is a supercapacitance <laughs> because it's only one nanometer. Um, there are um, the, the supercapacitors came to the world uh, because of the Ragon plot you can see there, uh, because they filled the gap between uh, f uh, simple capacitors, electrolytic capacitors, and the batteries from an uh, energy density point of view. Because uh, batteries uh, they are with a high, very high energy density, but uh, low power density, and the s simple capacitors are with a uh, high power density and low energy density. Okay, uh, our work is uh, about modifying uh, commercially available electrodes with diphenylalanine. It's 
בפנינל, זה כמו פנילוניל, ונאללה פנילוניל, אמינו אסיץ, ודי לאוצין. לאוצין, ונאללה לאוצין, אמינו אסיץ. מה אתה עושה? אנחנו עושים משהו משהו Oh, called uh, PVD physical vapor deposition, and uh, we in a vacuum we uh, deposit our um, diphenylalanine and leucine on these electrodes. What we can see is that uh, this PVD amorphous film, as you see here on the right, uh, is what we really get. And this film is composed of nano dots. I will explain later if you come to my poster. Um, in the in the in the 150 or 160 temperatures, it's a linear FF. A uh, graphene electrode is the electrode that we used. One of the electrodes that we used was a graphene electrode, as you can see there on the, on the same image. Okay, uh, about portability, you, you can see uh, as prepared graphene versus the LLPVD modified, there is a very a high uh, hydrophilic, as you can see, and the, the, the most important, the capacity. You can see uh, impedance uh, spectroscopy about the capacity uh, here. Uh, carbon um, graphitic uh, electrode, 16 microfarad per centimeter square against 1,600 microfarads per centimeter square. Okay, thank you very much. See my poster. Thank you. Use the microphone and use the uh, the microphone. Pointer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my hi. Uh, my name is Maya Evelyn from uh, from the group of uh, Yael Wolfman, and I work on the uh, photonic waveguides prepared by uh, holographic optical tweezers. Uh, the optical tweezers are a device that allows us to use light uh, in order to manipulate uh, uh, micro particles. And we were thinking uh, what applicative use we, we can make of the the hot, the holographic optical tweezers. Uh, and uh, our main uh, answer is photonic devices. Now, why use the HOTS and not uh, more traditional uh, fabrication methods? Well, first, the HOTS are very versatile. We can uh, trap and uh, manipulate objects uh, such as uh, colloidal color spheres, uh, such as nanotubes, uh, and some groups even show that we can uh, trap quantum dots. Uh, we can make uh, heterogeneous uh, microstructures involving uh, uh, materials of different kinds in the same, uh, in the same uh, microstructure. And we can make our microstructures uh, three-dimensional and we can also uh, dynamic, dynamically manipulate them while we work. Uh, all this make uh, the hearts very favorable in uh, making uh, photonic devices. And if we want to know, this doesn't work, uh, if we want to know how we are prepared to do that, we'll come see Mikosta. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Yuval Ifat. I'm from uh, Kobe Shoyer's lab. And this work is with collaboration with Michal Eitan, who's sitting back there. Say hi to her. What we want to do is to continue in a different aspect of what uh, Maya talked about. We want to trap nanoparticles using uh, light. No electricity, no other thing up our sleeves, just light and nano antennas. We want to do this by using the magical concept of de-electrophoresis, which I didn't know existed until roughly a year ago, and I expect only chemists and biologists probably know about it. In order to create this, uh, in order to create this de-electric foretic force, we need to take nano antennas, such as the ones which you can kind of see at the top, and shine them with laser lights, and, and create a very high divergent, a very high gradient electric field, which causes a small dielectric trap, which we want to use in order to trap the particles. Now, I see the hesitation in your eyes, and some of you have probably told me that, Yuval, we have, we're busy people. We don't have a lot of time. We have a lot of beer to drink, and we have lots of pretzels to eat during the session. Why, do, why should we spend the time here with, uh, in, with your poster? And today I can say that coming to our poster will be very interesting for you because you'll get not just one, but four very interesting things. First of all, you'll be able to get somebody on Skype. And other than that, you'll be able to get an explanation of the electrophoresis, including these uh, uh, equations and more, you'll be able to see our excellent, impressive the electrical, uh, optical setup and its discontents. You'll be able to hear me talk at length about the simulation results and get into boring details about how exactly I did them and what the problems were. And finally, you'll be able to hear our tantalizing, excellent, exciting, super, super interesting, super something, 
initial experimental results. So for all these reasons and more, it'll be like uh, four for one. There's not just one reason to come visit us. There's four and much, much more. And uh, all I can say is that I hope to see you very soon uh, from all the people down here. And um, hopefully. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nofar, and I'm from uh, Yossi Shacham's group, and I'm going to talk today on the stability of uh, electrolyte insulator, sorry, um, of um, electrolyte insulator sil uh, silicon device with a self-assembled monolayer as a gate uh, insulator. So here you can see my device, and um, there are many articles uh, in the, um, on this uh, field, uh, and all of them uh, can serve as a bias sensor. but. All the, all the articles, we don't see them in the industry. And we ask ourselves why. And the, the reason is, is that the, um, they are not stable under biological conditions. So our main goal is to find what are the optimal, optimal uh, condition for these measurements. And in my work, I will present you uh, two, um, two measurements uh, method. One is the uh, CV, a uh, capacitance voltage uh, measurement, and we did it uh, with the two uh, kind of buffer. The first one was um, PBS, and the second one was alkali-free PBS, because our assumption was that uh, alkali ions enter, penetrate by diffusion into the insulator, um, and we um, we did a XPS measurement, and we saw that actually there are alkali ions, but uh, in the uh, later measurements, uh, if you want to see, you need to come to my pastor, uh, we saw that uh, it doesn't uh, change the, the stability of the capacitor, so we did another uh, exam examination, and we did an uh, impedance support spectroscopy, excuse me, and then we actually saw that after one hour, um, there was very stable uh, results, and if you want what the exact uh, condition, you will come to see my poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elad Segev uh, from uh, uh, physical Electronics Department at Tel Aviv University in Amir, in Amir Natan's uh, group. And um, what that we are uh, researching is uh, graphene doping uh, with single atoms. Uh, we are doing a theoretical survey. And, uh, and as you know, graphene is a very uh, interesting material. It's a, a single uh, layer of uh, graphite, as you can uh, see. Um, a very uh, interesting and very unique uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, properties, and uh, that is why uh, we want to map the, uh, uh, all of the options for uh, doping. And in our case, we did it with uh, fluorine. Uh, as you can see, uh, you can see a, a DFT uh, uh, end result of uh, uh, ionic relaxation. Uh, where uh, two uh, fluorine uh, uh, atoms are uh, sitting on a five by five uh, uh, supercell or graphene, and uh, we just map all the different options uh, uh, when doping uh, two atoms and seeing whether uh, whether fluorine atoms want to cluster. And uh, if you want to see the results, uh, come and see our poster. Okay, so hi, my name is uh, Rama Vineri. I'm a graduate student of uh, Roy Bank, uh, and I'm going to talk a little about uh, calcium channels and their uh, measurement uh, through. Uh, uh, small angular X-ray scattering. Okay, so uh, this is actually a collaboration with uh, Almagor and Hirsch. Uh, where is the pointer? Okay. 
Uh, so they took these calcium channels, which are very important uh, parts uh, of the uh, of very important cells. Uh, they are in charge of transducing uh, electric signals into cells and causing very important functions uh, in your body, like the contraction of the heart, okay, uh, and uh, the release of neurotransmitters in uh, a synapse. And actually, they found that the rate that uh, this channel releases, uh, allows the passage of calcium channels into uh, the cells, and by that inducing the, the action involved, is determined by this little guy right here, somewhat determined by this proximal linker. This is a, uh, a small region that connects to this uh, this is basically the switch of the channel and we wanted to see what what's the structure of this little guy right here and how it compares between the two channels okay so this is uh, the CAV 1.2 channel uh, and it uh, mostly it, it exists mostly in the heart in the heart muscle and this one uh, is mostly in the synapses and this is basically the, the uh, small angle X-ray scattering uh, measurement. And uh, what we did here is we used an algorithm that we tell the flexibility of the, uh, of the particle, the, the protein that we're measuring, and it generates a lot, lots and lots of uh, confirmations. And we run a genetic algorithm and we select those confirmations that uh, match the measurement we did and we get very interesting results about the structure and the flexibility of the uh, two compared components and uh, that's it if you want to know more come visit my poster Hi, my name is Rana, and I'm also one of Roy Beck's students. I don't have a lot of time, and I'm afraid of Roy's buzzer, so I just want to invite you all to see my poster, and we can talk more about uh, we can talk more about targeted nano uh, drug uh, UV triggered delivery systems uh, made of liposomes uh, by using Sachs technique. We can measure structural changes and uh, uh, phase transitions upon UV treatment and uh, temperature change uh, in different buffer surroundings. So I'm near the coffee station, so you can drink coffee and talk to me. See you all. Hi, I'm Sheila, I'm from Sprintsack Group, and I will present in my poster a technique which is called biotinylation assay, and it can detect protein-protein interactions. In my case, it's a receptor notch and it's ligand delta. And here you see the concept of this proximity biotinylation assay. You have a protein A and B. To one of the proteins, you fuse a biotin ligase called Bir A. And to the other protein, you fuse um, a short acceptor peptide, AP. And when the proteins are in close proximity and they are interacting, the Bir A biotinylates the acceptor peptide which can be then um, detected by a fluorophore conjugate shaped avidin. And I will establish this technique for the notch delta system. I will study two main things. First, the interaction between notch and delta on neighboring cells, which you can see here. And also the dynamics of single notch and delta molecules, the endocytosis and why this technique compared to other protein-protein interaction a method I will explain you in my poster.
Hi, my name is uh, Dima Kaplan and I'm coming from uh, Fuel Cells and uh, Batteries Group uh, led by Emanuel Pellet in the uh, School of Chemistry. Uh, now, in uh, our poster we present our uh, work on uh, nanocatalysts for uh, proton exchange membrane fuel cells, which are uh, the most promising uh, range extender for electric vehicles. Uh, currently, uh, one of their main uh, problems uh, of those fuel cells is their very high price, and this is due to high usage of uh, platinum in the nanocatalysts. So basically, we are trying to uh, reduce the amount of platinum needed, and this is by uh, a structure which is called uh, a core shell structure with uh, the platinum uh, only on the shell of the nanoparticles, while the, the core is composed of a much cheaper metal. In this picture you can see one of the examples is ruthenium. Um, uh, so far we managed to achieve a, a nine-fold enhancement of uh, platinum utilization in those catalysts compared to commercial catalysts. And uh, if you want any additional info about uh, our work, you are uh, more than welcome to approach to our poster. Hi, my name is Raymond Blanga. I'm a PhD student um, under the supervision of Dina Golodinsky and Emmanuel Pellet and Menachem Nathan. Uh, my research is on um, a compo a development of uh, composite nanoparticle ceramics membranes for 3D micro batteries. <laughs> um, uh, here is uh, a schematic cross section of the micro battery uh, where all the layers are composed from um, nano uh, particles. Um, powders and the, um, the strategy of this research is to obtain an effective surface, a high, a high effective surface area, a maximum power and energy density uh, with a, um, within a battery footprint area. Um, some highlights um, why using uh, ceramic uh, membranes are um, Commercial membranes are uh, stable only at uh, 60 um, degrees Celsius and are produced um, as thin polymer films, uh, which cannot be inserted in the 3D um, channels. Um, the conformal coating of uh, 2D and 3D electrode mem materials by thin film ceramic uh, membranes is uh, mechanically and, and thermally stable which um, significantly uh, improved the battery safety. And the last point is uh, electrochemical properties of uh, electro -deposit uh, ele electrophoretic deposition um, of the membrane as is um, as similar uh, to the commercial. Thank you very much. Uh, you are more than welcome to your Hi, uh, my name is Yuri. I'm going to, to talk about the micro machine, the hot film probe uh, to measure uh, turbulence. Uh, these are the people that work uh, in our group. Uh, so this is uh, some pictures of turbulence and uh, turbulence is a part of our everyday life. Uh, and we, in order to continue to understand it, to keep understanding, we need to get sensors in to, that will measure it. Okay, uh, uh, the research, the research uh, nowadays is uh, concentrating mainly in, uh, on the part of simulating the turbulent flow because of the great computer power that is available nowadays. Uh, but the problem with the simulations is that in order to know that the simulation is working, you have to compare it to experimental results. And uh, so uh, what is the problem with that? that as you can see on this picture, this is a really nice picture of uh, uh, Da Vinci. Uh, you can see it on every uh, turbulent uh, conference. But what you can see on this picture is uh, this uh, 
that there is a large uh, amount of uh, small eddies. Okay, all the you can see the the, uh, the different land scales. Okay, that are present in the flow. So basically, what are this all this uh, simulation are modeling? They can model only the uh, these uh, large scales. Okay, you can see these large scales, and they are uh, transferring energy to smaller scales. Okay, so the problem is in this area. If you look at the okay the energy spectrum of these uh, eddies, then uh, the smaller eddies, we don't know what's happening in there. Okay, in order to, to this is uh, modeled as a black box in all the simulations. In order to achieve uh, uh, an information about what is happening in these scales, we need uh, smaller sensors, um, and uh, this is uh, the solution that we are working on. It's called the hot uh, wire probe. Okay, and this is the solution. So what you see here is a multi-array uh, structure. Okay, each array has uh, four uh, hot wire probes. A hot wire probe is a very thin uh, wire that is heated above, using an uh, electrical current, it is heated above uh, the ambient temperature so the airflow uh, can uh, cool it and uh, change it the resistance okay, of the wire. And then all the, wi the wire is connected to an uh, electricity uh, circuit that uh, returns, that stabilizes its resistivity. It means it's uh, returning the temperature to the constant. It keeps the, the, the wire in a constant temperature. And that's, that way, you, using the feedback loop, we can uh, feel the changes in the flow, okay? all these fluctuations of the velocity. Uh, so if we, you look at, uh, okay, we have uh, five arrays. If you look at one array, it is an order of one millimeter, and we are doing much smaller arrays order of uh, half uh, micron, uh, 50 microns. Okay. Thank you. So hi, my name is uh, Vlindenfeld. I'm a student of Ron Lifshitz and uh, Eli Eisenberg, and I will tell you a little bit about my current research about dissipation of, vibrational, uh, of vibrations by uh, interaction with electrons in metallic nanobeams. Uh, now, the quality factor of um, uh, nanoresonator is a very crucial feature for many of the application of these resonators, um, such as uh, force sensing, single spin detection, and more. Um, now, by using metallic resonators, we can uh, couple between uh, electronic and mechanical degrees of freedom, which is a desirable feature. Uh, however, uh, the same feature also uh, induces additional dissipation to the system and therefore degrades the quality factor. So we are investigating how uh, fluctual modes and uh, longitudinal modes in such uh, uh, nanobeams uh, interact with the free electrons of uh, the metallic beam and uh, therefore uh, uh, induces dissipation and just to summarize very shortly uh, we find uh, that uh, longitudinal modes are uh, highly dissipated by such uh, interactions the flexural modes are less dissipated however they uh, display some very interesting features, uh, such as the resonantic effect shown in this graph um, as you vary the uh, Fermi energy of uh, uh, the nanobeam. Um, and these uh, uh, features can be seen mainly at uh, uh, low temperatures and uh, short wavelengths. And for additional features of the dissipation, both longitudinal and flexural modes, Come and see the poster. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, I'm Sakayat. I did this work uh, in collaboration with uh, Olga Ose. It's about uh, photo activation of uh, protein expression. So we want uh, to study cell-to-cell -cell, uh, signaling in a control manner. Uh, for example, if we have uh, two cells, uh, two neighbor cells, and we want one of them to 
express some protein so we can uh, activate it. And our method is uh, addition of uh, cage uh, doxycycline or, or uh, cyclophen, the cage molecule that you heard about before. And uh, then we illuminated it and uh, get the fluorescent uh, protein expression. And uh, my congratulations, you get to the last slide for today. Maybe the it may be the best one. Uh, that's our results. Uh, I think the picture talks about itself, but uh, if you want to hear me talking about it, if you want uh, to see the mystery all go there and see other pictures, you should come to the end of the room in the left corner, the dark side there, there we Thank you. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I took the urgency of this session very seriously. Yeah, so uh, it's not on the slide because, you know, the urgency. So, my name is Guy Jacobi, and I'm a grad student at the Ray, Ray Beck Lab in Tel Aviv. Um, and I'm not in the book of abstracts because of uh, my, a mistake by my part, so, but my poster's on the floor room in any case. Uh, so, my work is on lipids. Uh, they were vigorously uh, studied throughout you know the last 40 years, but uh, as part of a drug delivery vesicle system uh, in a cooperation with uh, Professor Dan Peer and his, his student uh, Kevin Cohen, uh, we study two lipids who, when thrown into water or solution, they create MLVs, as everyone knows, uh, and these MLVs can be used as drug vesicles, and uh, we study these and can characterize these vesicles using our beautiful customizable in-house sax and wax system. Um, and we can produce these nice 2D images uh, which show peaks corresponding to uh, spacings within the multilamellar vesicles. Um, and what I'll show you now is uh, using temperature, uh, changing temperature uh, and using um, time-lapsed um, measurements, what you see here, I'll use the pointer, uh, is when you take the, the MLVs and put them at 37 degrees, they have, uh, first of all, a, a, a despacing, which corresponds to the, uh, the uh, bilayer spacing in, in, the, in the MLV. Uh, and uh, you have short range uh, distances, which correspond to the distances between the, bi the lipids within the bilayer itself, uh, which uh, suggests that the, the bilayer is in a crystalline phase. Uh, and when you heat it up to 60 degrees, as seen here, uh, it goes to an L-alpha state, which basically means that the uh, bilayer itself liquefies and it becomes uh, more or less like a, a liquid, and uh, short-range ordering it disappears. Uh, but you can still see that uh, there is the long-range ordering which corresponds to the uh, distances between the lamellas. Um, uh, Cooling back down, I'm short on time, cooling back down uh, to 37 degrees uh, happens right over here after the heating, uh, but you, what you see is you see a relaxation period in which for tens of hours, and this depends on the, the, um, um, the stoichiometry between the, the two lipids, uh, for tens of hours there's a metastable state in which the L-alpha state, it stays in the L-alpha state and then only then uh, the LC reappears. Uh, and if you want to hear more about that, then please come to my poster, and it's in the middle of the room, and uh, it's the one without the number. So. Hi, my name is uh, Micha. I'm uh, also a student of uh, Roy Beck. Yeah, okay. Uh, what uh, we are presenting in this poster is uh, basically... Shalom in Shalom My name is... Uh, Micha, I'm a student of uh, Roy Beck. Uh, what we're presenting in this poster is uh, uh, work done by uh, several members of our group, and I'm standing here on behalf of them. Uh, what we are studying here is basically, uh, what we show in this poster is basically an in uh, vivo and in vitro study of intermediate filaments. Now, what are intermediate filaments? Many probably here ask, do not be intimidated by this biology. Uh, Intermediate filaments are part of a cytoskeleton. This is basically the scaffold, pigumin, scaffold of our cells. 
So this is basically something of interest to all those present in this hall. We all are very interested in the scaffold that give uh, properties to our cells, whether it's a cell found in the eye or in the brain or a skin cell. They would all have different properties, very much dominated by the nature of uh, these proteins, of these intermediate proteins. You see here a filamentous network uh, found in cells. So uh, part of our study is, as I said, in vitro, which means not in a living system, but in a tube. We're studying here uh, basically three types of neurofilament uh, proteins, intermediate filaments, a specific type, which is found in our brains. These are able to make amazing, very complex self-assembly uh, complexes. Uh, these complexes are interesting for us in a physical context. Okay, what we are examining basically are the interactions. Interactions dominating uh, this uh, self-assembly. We are measuring interfilamentous uh, distances and our way of doing this is basically the ideal way of, uh, of uh, being able to study such, uh, uh, such uh, interactions in uh, biological systems. We are doing this using uh, small angle x-ray scattering. This allows us to do all of our studies without uh, crystallization, without freezing anything. We can do this in solution. We can uh, tweak things. Uh, for example, we can change osmotic pressure. We can change uh, salts, salts composition, divalent, monovalent salts. And thus, this has enabled us to uh, examine the interactions, uh, these physical interactions. Furthermore, in vivo uh, study, done in live cells, uh, we insert, by means of transfection, uh, cells that, uh, excuse me, proteins, intermediate proteins that are labeled into living cells, and then we're able to see, these are all different uh, proteins in the same cell, we're able to see how they are in the living cell. Uh, thank you, come see us, this is poster 17. This was an error, and the credits below. Flexer. I'm uh, from the School of Physics, uh, Yoram Dagan's group, and uh, my poster is about the unique interface between two very simple uh, ceramic materials, and uh, what is exactly this interface? So basically we take uh, the first ceramic and we use a laser, very much like this, and we sputter on top of it the, the second ceramic, and if we look uh, closely, and we do the process in a very controlled uh, temperature and pressure. Uh, sorry, we do the the process in a very controlled uh, temperature and uh, and pressure. And we look closely and we see the the lattice is maintained throughout the interface, and it as, looks as if it's a it's a single lattice. Just uh, you can see the unit cells going uh, up uh, as if it was a single lattice. The scales here uh, we we can control the process to a to a resolution of one unit cell which is a uh, four angstrom. So we actually can decide how many uh, unit cells we want to deposit and uh, we have a very good resolution. And what is about, what's so special about this interface that we want to study it? So we took two, two ceramics. They, are, they have no uh, conducting, uh, conducting uh, they're, they're not conductors and they're not magnetic. And we get not only a conductor, we get a superconductor, which is better than a conductor. And uh, also, we took they, that they don't have any magnetic uh, uh, magnetic uh, qualities, but we get the magnetic qualities in the inter interface, which is highly unusual to get uh, superconduction and magnetic. And not only that, we get it in a two-dimensional system, which is even more unusual. And uh, this is interesting. And we we want to try and study the the possibility of uh, the existence of uh, superconducting and magnetic magnetism in the same time in this uh, two-dimensional system. In order to do that, we measure uh, magnetic resistance, for instance, and we get flowers, which is also pretty special. And if you want to know 
what exactly are these flowers and why will, do we get them? You can visit the poster. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lia Engel and I'm a PhD student of Yossi Shacham and Slava Krilov. Um, my main field is, uh, is uh, polymeric MEMS and electroactive polymers, but today I want to talk to you about a project that I've been spending a lot of time on recently, um, which is based on hydrogels, um, stimuli responsive hydro hydrogels, which uh, undergo volumetric transitions um, as a response to the surrounding solution, for example, the pH, um, the uh, the composition of the solvent, the ionic strength. Um, interestingly, they also undergo um, volume transitions um, as a response to electrical fields. Before we move on to the next slide and talk about the response to electrical fields, which is ben beneficial for two reasons. First of all, it allows for, um, for a, a new degree of control over the volumetric transitions and also um, the possibility of introducing feedback mechanisms. This, for this specific project, we want to talk about um, um, occlusion of arteries using, using uh, basically a chunk of hydrogel for that purpose. And uh, here, just to get a sense of the, of the changes in volume that these hydrogels can undergo, this is, over there to the left, is a hydrogel that, that came out of a tube, but that's how it was synthesized. Um, one morning, I came into the lab after placing it in water, and it had actually escaped from the beaker. Um, it just swelled right out out of it. You can get thousands of percentages of swelling. And this is in SEM, you can see the porous nature that allows for the swelling. Um, what's interesting, if, if you change the, con one more minute, okay. If you change the, the, the solution, then you get uh, typically isotropic changes. If you apply an electrical field, then you actually get bending. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, explanations for this mechanism. Um, we, in order to check the mechanism of the bending, we built a tank with perspex, uh, um, out of perspex with uh, platinum electrodes. Um, and then in order to, to check the, the volume trans transitions, um, we have interdigitated electrodes. To understand the different kinds of fields generated from both setups and the results, you can come see my poster where I talk about um, the shrinkage or swelling as a result of the field and also the bending. Okay. You can...